All right. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Um, it's so great to be back here after all this time. Finally, we have a real world meetup again. Yeah, um, Munich is, of course, for me, every, very special every, every year. So thank you very much for inviting me again. It's really a big honor to be here. So I always try to do something a bit special for Munich. So last year, I actually gave the only online talk of the year for Munich because at some point I said, I don't want to do these online talks anymore, but I did one for Munich. And this year I also have something special. I actually have a new talk. So this is a talk I've never given anywhere else, at least not in public. Um, so I've given a version of it to a bunch of game developers, but that was not public. So this is a public premiere of a new talk. And it's a bit of a, a new style as well, because usually when I give talks, I like to dr really drill down into one topic and explain how or talk about how this works or what the problem there is. And this is kind of a little bit more high level. It's a bit more, I'm just going to paint like a broad picture of what low latency C++ is and mention a bunch of things, but not going into too much detail, but rather just kind of give references like, here's a talk where you can read on, up on this, or here's a book that mentions this, and kind of just, it's, it's a little bit more kind of high level. So let's see how it goes. I always appreciate feedback about my talks as well. Um, and yeah, so, so we're gonna talk about low latency C++, but before we do that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself. I do kind of three things that have to do with C++. One, of course, is my uh, job. As Klaus already said, I'm developer advocate at JetBrains, uh, which is where we are right now. We are in the JetBrains Munich office, as you have noticed. So um, yeah, we have a bunch of C++ tools. We have, of course, C-Line, uh, which is our C++ IDE. Um, we now have a really cool update of that. Just, just very recently, it came out. We now support modules. We have a new UI that you can check out. And we have a CMake debugger and lots of other cool stuff. There's also ReSharp C++, which is our Visual Studio plugin. And Rider is an IDE for .NET and um, also Unreal game engine development. So this is kind of what we work on. Um, the other thing that I also did or Klaus mentioned is um, I worked in the audio and music technology industry for a while. And um, actually, I'm still kind of a little bit involved in that because I did co-found a company called Cradle a few years ago. Um, and although it's not my day job anymore, you know, I'm still a little bit involved in that. And um, we make uh, music uh, software. This is a uh, product called, um, oh, oh, uh, <laughs> The Spirit. This is the one. It's a vocal processor. Um, and that's a lot of low latency C++ going on there, right? So this is all real-time processing. So... This is kind of the application, one of those applications of this kind of stuff that we're going to be talking about. Um, and then the third thing that I do that also Klaus mentioned, thank you, Klaus, is I have been on the committee now for since about 2016. I was active there. Uh, so I've been there for part of the C17 release cycle, all of the C20 release cycle, and all of the C23 release cycle, which is going to come to an end in February. We have uh, the meeting in Issaquah, you're going to approve uh, the final version of C++23. So that's very exciting. It's going to come out very soon. Um, right, so, so let's talk about low latency. So what is, what is low latency? And what does it have to do with this other thing called performance? Right? This is something that I think a lot of people have of different concepts about. Um, so if you think about um, performance um, as a pipe where data is flowing through, um, then it turns out that throughput and latency are actually kind of two orthogonal aspects of performance, right? So, so uh, latency is how long it takes for the data to you know, arrive where it needs to be, and throughput is how much data per second or whatever unit of time you can process, right? So they are kind of orthogonal. And then there's this other thing uh, which people call real time. And then there's hard real time, soft real time, near real time. And somehow that's often mentioned together with low latency. Um, and so what that means is kind of this idea that, um, um, that um, 
if you have a, a piece of code and it does something, give you results, not only does it need to be correct, but also it needs to give you that result within a fixed amount of time. Okay, so if, if you have a deadline of, let's say, one millisecond and you don't get a result within that one millisecond, your program is incorrect, even if the result is in the end correct. Right? So this is kind of the idea um, of real time. And, and now we come to this kind of bigger, uh, bigger topic of performance. And actually, it turns out there are, there are um, hang on. Sorry, I need to interrupt here. I have, I have a problem with my screen. Please bear with me. Um, what I need to do is I need to switch it to, apologies. We should have tested this in advance. Um, right. So this should be hopefully better. Yes, apologies for that. Um, so it turns out um, there's like different aspects of performance. And the way I think about this is this kind of spectrum where on the kind of on the left end, you have low latency and on the, on the right end, you have high throughput, which is kind of the two orthogonal aspects. And then uh, you have this like zone in between where you kind of care about both. And depending on which you care about more, you're going to be on one or the other side of the spectrum. If you're all the way on the, on the right side of the spectrum, what you want to do is you want to optimize the average performance of a piece of code, right? So because the, the faster something or the more performance something runs on average, if you do it many, many times, you're going to be processing more data, right? And so on the other end of the spectrum, you want to do something very different. You want to optimize for the worst case performance because you don't care so much about how much data you're going to process. That You don't care about the cumulative effect. What you care about is you want to get the answer as fast as possible every single time, right? So that means you care about the worst case performance and not about the average case performance. So that's a really important kind of distinction. And then there is this term efficiency, which is kind of in between. And the, the way I understand efficiency, and I'm curious if anybody has another definition, but the definition I'm going to use is basically if something's efficient, you need less work or energy for some definition of that term to do that thing, right? So, and it turns out, if you can make something more efficient, a lot of the time, you're going to be improving actually both the throughput and the latency, right? So this is kind of affecting, affecting both, both ends. So one example here would be, uh, if you want to increase the throughput, you build a new lane on the motorway. And it might or might not make lead to like the cars arriving faster, but primarily it's to have more lanes, to have more cars per second. Uh, on the low latency end of the spectrum, an example is the invention of the telegraph, right? So telegraph has a lot less bandwidth than a written letter, right? Um, but it arrives a lot faster. So this is kind of low latency. And my example for efficiency is like the invention of the wheel, right? So if you do that, it's going to be just a lot easier to transport things from A to B, and then probably you're going to increase both throughput and, and low latency. And so um, there are certain domains where low latency seems to be particularly important. And um, this is certainly the case in gaming, uh, in audio processing, which is what uh, I spend a lot of time doing, uh, high frequency trading, um, finance, um, and then some embedded application like automotive, aeronautics, robotics, and stuff like that, where you have sensors or you know, other systems that need to do something very fast. I'm actually quite curious, um, out of the people in this room, who works in one of those industries where low, low latency is really important? OK, cool. So that's like half the room. So I'm really curious uh, what you think about what I'm going to be talking about and whether you do things in the same way or in different ways or you have different techniques that I've not heard about and stuff like that. So actually. Very, very curious about that kind of feedback. So um, we can categorize those domains kind of in the way of like, where are they on the spectrum? And so if you have high frequency trading, uh, they're like all the way in the very extreme end of the latency. There's like a hyper focus on the lowest latency possible. All your processing is kind of similar. 
in gaming, you do care about throughput actually quite a lot as well, because you want to render as much stuff as possible, right? But you also don't want to have drop frames. So, so you kind of care about both, but it's still a little bit more to the left side, because if you have the, chan the, the choice between rendering more stuff or dropping frames, you probably don't want to drop frames. You'd, you'd rather render less stuff, but not drop frames so that the user has a smooth experience. So, so this is still kind of on the left side here. And then embedded, I just drew like a big blob because there's just so many different applications. I can't just, you know, uh, um, put all industries into one spot here. Um, and then there's a bunch of other applications which are kind of on the other side. And I've given just a few examples. I think probably the, the best example of something that's all the way to the right is a scientific simulation where you do like a big numeric simulation and you really care about whether the simulation is going to run three days or 10 days, right? So you want to really optimize it, but you don't have this latency aspect at all. You just want it to compute as much as possible in as little time as possible, but kind of accumulate it over the whole time uh, that the simulation is going to be running. So you don't care about the latency aspect at all. If you have an internet server, you do care about the latency, but you probably care more about the bandwidth most of the time. And then I just put quantitative finance in there, which is like computing these big financial models and stuff, because it's kind of similar to the simulation bit, but it's actually in the same industry as HFT. It's just a different application within the same industry. And, and so even if you're in the same industry, you can end up on different sides of the spectrum. And so this is kind of the stuff that I call low latency programming. And it turns out that in low latency programming, a lot of the time you have this concept of a hot path, okay? So you have a particular uh, programming path which gives you some result or some computation or something else that needs to be very quick, uh, very fast, and typically there's some kind of deadline uh, attached to it. So we can also sort the different applications on um, what the deadline is. And then we get a graph something like this. If you're doing high frequency trading, you're operating with very, very low latencies. If you're doing like FPGA stuff, we are certainly in nanosecond territory. If you're doing C++, it's probably more like one millisecond or two milliseconds or something like this would be a typical acceptable latency. Uh, like when you get some info from the market to decide whether or not to send an order. In audio, you have a little bit more time, uh, depending on the sample rate and buffer size of your system, you have somewhere between one and five milliseconds typically. Uh, to produce a result. If you don't, then things go bad. We're going to see that in a minute. In gaming, it depends. If you're on a console, you probably have a fixed frame rate. So you're going to be 60 hertz or 16 milliseconds. If you're on a PC, maybe you can have a variable frame rate, so it can go even below. Embedded really depends on what you're doing. And just for kind of comparison, one millisecond, this is how much it takes light to travel 300 meters, which is like the height of the Eiffel Tower. So it's not really that much time. Um, and then um, I put GUI here. If you have like a typical simple application GUI with buttons and sliders and stuff, then you don't want this to lag. You want this to be fluid. But we're kind of in a 100 millisecond territory here. And it's typically considered not really low latency, even though you do care about you know that being fluid and the user having a good experience. But typically, like, that's going to be enough if, if you're somewhere in this 100 millisecond territory. And typically, it's such an app, that's not going to be the hot path. The hot path is going to be somewhere else, even if, if there is one. So, so um, kind of, it's, it's to the other side of this, of this dashed line. And so another thing that we can look at is what happens if, for some reason, our code doesn't give us the answer that we need within these nanoseconds, microseconds, whatever that is. And that, again, depends on the industry. If you're writing a game and, and you're rendering frames, you don't want to drop video frames. This is kind of the stuff that people look at in reviews uh, of video games or the user notices. But, you know, how bad is this? If you occasionally drop a frame, maybe people will still buy your game. If you, um, if you make audio software and then you miss the deadline and you fail to write an audio buffer in time, then you get an audible glitch or click. So that's really bad. If, if you're doing some professional audio software, right? You don't wanna do a recording and then there's like a glitch in there or um, you know, playing on a stage and then there's like an audible click in your performance. In high frequency trading, uh, if you're not the fastest, 
uh, then you can lose money. You can lose lots of money. You can lo lose millions of dollars um, if your latency is not low enough. And in some embedded use cases, you know, it could be um, you know safety critical stuff like an airbag has to work within a certain number of time, and if it doesn't, then people might die. Right. So it's actually also kind of a spectrum here. How bad is it? How hard is the real time aspect? How bad is it if you if you miss your your deadline? And another thing that I looked at, which I found really interesting, is that all of these different use cases, the hot path seems to have like a slightly different topology to it. And, and let me let me try and visualize what I mean what I mean by that. So in audio, for example, you have this one audio thread which is generating the the sound, and then you have this callback that comes essentially from the sound card every one to 10 milliseconds, depending on what your settings are. And then you have to produce basically your next audio buffer that's going to be played back to the speakers before the next callback comes around. And if you fail to do that, uh, you get a glitch. So you have this kind of regular callback and your hot path is when your callback is being called, you have to, as fast as possible, produce some audio data or do your processing. So you have this like regular, it's literally on a timer, right? So the sound card literally has a quartz crystal somewhere. So you have like a, callback that comes on a timer. And then you have a bunch of other threads doing other stuff, like rendering a GUI, or maybe you're playing a keyboard so it's getting MIDI messages in, or it's writing something to, to disk, or reading from disk, or whatever. So you have all these other threads going on. You have to communicate with them. If you're writing a game, depending on the platform and the game, you might be um, you, your hot path might be one thread, or it might be multiple threads. So it's actually interesting because um, if you're writing a big game on a console, you want to have as many threads as possible. Um, you want to have as many threads as possible rendering stuff because then you can render more stuff. Your game is going to look more shiny, right? So, so this is remarkable because then you have multiple threads. Um, you have a parallel hot path. You have hot paths and multiple threads simultaneously. But very similar to the uh, rendering audio, rendering video also, you have a frame rate, which is a bit longer, a bit slower. But then you have these regular callbacks, right? And then you have to, or it's not really a callback, it's a little bit different. You kind of push the data to the GPU, right? But um, you have this regularity aspect, this timed aspect to it. If you're doing um, high frequency trading, it's a little bit different. You don't have this regularity in there, but you get market updates from the exchange, right? And then you have to decide very quickly, oh, do I need to send an order to the exchange? And so, so you need to make a very quick decision um, and that's going to be a hot path, and that's going to be triggered by you know, data from the, from the market, from the exchange coming in. But that's not going to be uh, like on a timer or something like that. Um, and so if you do embedded, and I'm sure some of you know this a, a lot better than I do because I'm not actually an embedded engineer, it's kind of similar to the previous one, except depending on the system, you might get interrupts. You might, you might um, instead of callbacks or something like this, you might get an interrupt, and then again, you have to do your I.O. very quickly. Or there's another way uh, where some firmware is written like this, where you have a super loop. You just have like a big infinite loop, and then all your tasks are being called inside this infinite loop. But again, uh, like you don't want any task to just to take too long, because then the whole thing just stops, right? And so we have these different topologies, and I'm sure there's more as well. This is not the only way to do this depending on what you're doing, but they all have this common aspect that you have this, this hot path and stuff needs to happen really quickly there. So here's another thing. How much control do you have over the hardware that the stuff is running on? So um, kind of on this axis, the vertical axis is how powerful the platform is. And on the X axis is how much control do you have as a developer over, over that? And so if you're doing, Audio software that needs to run on consumer laptops and consumer phones. It can be all kinds of stuff. Uh, you might do Mac only. Probably you want to do Windows, maybe Linux, maybe phones, maybe Android. So you have all kinds of hardware. You don't really know how good it is. So everything has to run on all of them. So it's kind of on the left. In gaming, the blob is a bit bigger because you might be writing a game for a phone or a PC. Then you have the same problem. You might be writing a game for a console where you know the specifications pretty exactly, right? And then in HFT, what people use is they have their own racks with their own customized hardware. And then embedded, you have even more control because you actually design, design the actual hardware yourself, right? And so, so this is kind of different aspects of, of this kind of low latency programming. 
And the question now is, why do we use C++ for that? Because it seems to be that for some reason, C++ is an especially good language to do these things that we just talked about. And so, so why is that? Well, one reason is we do have manual memory management in C++, which has a downside. It's not safe. There is a big discussion going on about that uh, on the committee right now. But uh, it lets you do, it lets you control on a very low level what's, what's happening. So you can program in a way that uh, you avoid things like allocations, deallocations, which you don't want to do in a hot path. Uh, you can be very low level. Um, the other thing that C++ has that C, for example, doesn't have so much is we have scalable zero cost abstractions, right? We have algorithms, templates, uh, concepts now, and, and all kinds of other stuff. So, so we can actually uh, you know, do this at scale and still have maintainable code, right? So we all know this kind of stuff. Uh, we have containers, we have templates, we have algorithms, and, and we can write really beautiful code with those tools. And then the thing that C++ has, I think, probably over Rust, although that gap maybe will close uh, at some point in the future, but certainly today, um, there is a huge body of existing libraries and frameworks that Rust doesn't have as much for, at least for some of those industries. Like, for example, if you're doing an audio plugin, Juice is a very good solution, and I don't think Rust has anything like that. For gaming, you have Unreal Engine and other solutions, where, again, C++ is pretty unique in having these massive frameworks that let you, you know, give you all the tools that you need uh, for these industries. And so uh, we use C++, but what's the kind of C++ that we, that we use? Because if you, if you write uh, low latency software, we are going to write probably a bit different C++ than, than people who care about bandwidth or people who care about something else. And so, um, again, there are these, like, I'll we'll say three things, right? There's the spectrum, like you're either on the left side, you care about the worst case. On the right side, you care about the average case. And in the middle, you kind of care about efficiency overall, which probably is good for both. And um, we don't really care about the right side, right? So we, if you're doing low latency, we care about those two things. We care about obviously low latency itself, and we care about efficiency overall. And so, um, if you talk about C++ techniques for low latency programming, there's really two categories of them, right? There are, there are uh, uh, techniques that target efficiency, which is the thing in the middle, which are very important because stuff will be faster if it's more efficient. And there are techniques that are specifically targeting low latency, so specifically choosing uh, to optimize the worst case over the average case. And that's where low latency becomes different from people who write software for a server, for example, a big internet server that also has to be performant but prioritizes bandwidth over low latency. But of course, the most critical thing is to actually measure stuff, right? Because if you don't measure, you don't know if anything you did is actually faster or slower or more or less efficient than anything else, right? And the interesting thing is that this is often very, very surprising and counterintuitive. So uh, there is this book by uh, Fyodor Picos, um, which is not about low latency. It's about efficiency overall, but it is relevant. Um, and he has some interesting examples in there of code where, oh, you do this, and clearly it's doing less work now, but for some reason it's slower. And there was another talk at the Audio Developer Conference this year by Dave Rowland, and he also had, had a great example where basically you can compute... Uh, the minimum of a range or the maximum of a range. Oh, but we have std minmax that computes both at the same time. So that should be faster. And he benchmarked it and turned out on some compilers it's actually slower. Completely counterintuitive. You wouldn't expect that. But you need to measure. And of course, in order to measure, we have um, lots of tools, right? So we have profiling. We have countless tools for that. Uh, we actually have uh, um, two of them integrated in C-Line, perf on Linux and dtrace. Uh, on, on Mac. So if you open C-Line, there is a profile button there. You can profile your code directly from the IDE, which is pretty cool. But um, on other platforms, there's also other tools. There's VTune, which is very popular. There is this distinction between sampling profiling versus instrumentation profiling, right? Where you either just take a sample of what the code is already doing, or you insert more stuff. So you, can, you get like a more detailed view of what's going on, but you also actually change what's going on. So there was a talk by Mathieu Rupert um, last year at CPPCon, the basics of profiling, which I think is really cool and explains kind of all of that. 
then kind of apart from just profiling, we can also do some more detailed performance analysis. So we have all these tools to measure catch misses, branch miss predicts. Uh, there is a technique, at least on Linux, to like catch any syscalls. So you know whether, whether you're doing any syscalls in your code, which you probably shouldn't do in low latency code. Uh, or whether you're doing any allocations and stuff like that. You can, of course, inspect uh, the generated assembly with things like Compiler Explorer or just look at what your compiler generated. And sometimes that's very useful, but it can also be kind of a trap as well. Because a lot of the time, like, I've seen generated assembly and I was like, wow, this is like so, so much less than the, the assembly of this less optimal code. But then you benchmark it and it's actually the same, like in terms of runtime. So can be deceiving, but can also be very interesting. And of course, benchmarking, right? So we have lots of tools for that as well. And uh, we kind of have uh, to benchmark the actual code that we're going to run. Uh, but there's also micro benchmarks, which are tricky, right? So if you're doing micro benchmarks, you need to make sure you're measuring something meaningful, right? You need to warm the cache to make sure you're not just measuring cache misses instead of what your code is actually doing. You probably want to randomize the heap, so otherwise, you, if you just allocate things one after the other, you're going to get a very different memory layout than in production. So again, you're going to get very different results. You want to measure your code, you know, compile with the same flags as in production, so release. But you also want to, you don't want to the optimizer to optimize away your business logic because then again, you're not measuring the thing that you want to measure. So it's kind of tricky. Um, it can be very useful to understand how a certain piece of code performs, but you still always need to also measure your actual production code. And so I'm not gonna talk about measuring and tools further here. I'm gonna talk about zero source techniques. And so, as we said, we have these kind of two types, right? We have techniques for efficiency and we have techniques for low latency. Let's talk about uh, efficiency first because this is kind of more universal. Um, and writing efficient code really requires all of these things. You need to know C++ really well. You need to know whatever libraries you're using. You need to know your compiler and your optimizer and how they behave, right? You need to have a feeling for that. You need to know your ABI, as we're going to see later. And you need to really know uh, the hardware architecture you're targeting, right? So you need to know what the CPU is like, the instruction set, the pipeline, um, whether you have any SIMD capabilities. Um, what the cache hierarchy is on that platform, right? Because that's going to massively uh, impact performance. Whether it has a prefetcher and a branch predictor and how they behave and all of that stuff. And it turns out that it seems like as you progress further down this list, resources on this kind of stuff become harder and harder to obtain. Like, yes, you can go ahead and read a book about C++ and you're going to know how to write code, um, but that's not enough, right? So you need to know all these other things as well if you really want to write low latency software. But it's very difficult to actually get resources on those things, right? I mean, if you're reading a, you know, a CPU manual designed for CPU hardware architects, I don't understand what they're saying there. Like, um, so it can be very difficult to, um, to, to obtain actually useful information, um, especially if, as you go further down this list. Particularly, uh, knowledge of hardware architecture is tricky. So on, on Intel, uh, for Intel architectures, there's this legendary our person, Agne Fogg, uh, and he has these optimization manuals uh, that I'm sure some of you have read or have seen or are aware about with so many tricks about how to um, kind of about the internal architecture. But I don't know about anything equivalent for ARM. And ARM is becoming more and more important, right, for consumer software. This laptop has an ARM chip. My phone has an ARM chip. I want to have games on these devices, right? And I want to have audio software on these devices. So if anybody knows, by the way, about good resources, like where to if something like this exists for ARM, I would be very curious. Um, so, but let's start, let's start at the top. Let's start with the stuff where it's just C++, right? And obviously there are lots of things you can do uh, to make stuff more efficient, like avoid unnecessary work, right? This is, the, this is the obvious one. You can avoid unnecessary copies. That's a very easy thing. I'm sure lots of you have been in this situation uh, where you have something like this in your code and then, oh, you know, you're copying strings there and you then change it and then your code runs a lot faster, right? So I think this is probably something that a lot of you have found in many code bases that you've worked with. Uh, another more subtle example, um, 
here um, you have um, a vector of strings and you have an algorithm and then some lambda that so so here's here's some kind of string and then uh, we capture that in the lambda and then inside the lambda we are kind of modifying that right and so so it turns out that this modification potentially it creates a new string so it's potentially an, an allocation but because the lambda is inside a std find if you're doing this every time around you go around the loop right but it's completely unnecessary because um, that's going to give you the same result every time so what you can do here is you can actually use an init capture and lift it into the init capture of the lambda and you do this only once right so you save a lot of cycles and then you just use it um, a good idea also is to avoid unnecessary function calls and indirections. Uh, so we can use inline functions, but it's actually tricky because if you inline functions too much, you bloat your binary and then uh, it affects code layouts. So you might get instruction cache misses. So it's a bit of a balance, right? We can avoid uh, virtual function calls, instead use the variant and CRTP. And of course, countless talks have been given about this. Make as many decisions as possible at compile time. Const expert everything, use template metaprogramming, um, something that's really cool that you can now do with C20 and const expert vector and all of these things that we now have is you can generate lookup tables at compile time instead of at runtime and all of these things. Um, using efficient mathematical operations. This is something that occurs in many of these domains. Fast approximations. Here's a classic example from Quake, uh, the fast, fast inverse square root, which computes the inverse square root of a number very, very quickly with just a few <laughs> bit shifts and, and, and tricks. Um, and it's not as precise as the correct thing, but it's precise enough for games and you need this operation there a lot. Of course, this is undefined behavior. You're doing type punning here. Don't do this. Um, please use bitcast. We have that in C20 now. It compiles down to the same thing, but it's actually undefined behavior, not undefined behavior. Um, I did a talk about this um, stuff uh, in 2019, uh, where it's like an hour just about basically those low-level tricks. Um, it's a bit outdated because ever since then, we also got um, missed lifetime types in CSS20 and still start lifetime as coming in CSS23. So maybe I should do an updated version of that talk or something. Um, this occurs a lot. So in games, you need inverse square root a lot. I remember when I was doing music software, we needed exponential functions a lot because you change a lot between log and linear scales. So we had like a similar approximation for fast exponential functions and things like that. So you know, they can be a lot faster than, than, than the correct full standard library version of that algorithm. Um, so yeah, you kind of have to be aware of these low level bit manipulation things, right? So if you do stuff like this, in order to not run into undefined behavior, you need to be aware of the object lifetime rules, aliasing rules, alignment, uh, object representation and value representation in C++, like the actual bits that make up a value. Uh, we have now bitcast, which gives you safe type punning. We have implicit lifetime types, and um, since it was just 23, we have start lifetime as. So we're getting more and more facilities to kind of do, this, <coughs> excuse me, do these low level, low level operations kind of more safely than we could do in C, for example. So um, yeah, that's one thing. Another thing which surprisingly has a huge effect is use powers of two as much as you can for sizes of things. I've seen a case where uh, you know changing the size of an array from a non-power of two to a power of two made the code 30 times faster because then the compiler can just replace the division or mod operation with the bit shift, which is just a lot faster. And there's many, many other techniques, and there have been you know, countless talks about this, but this is kind of the stuff that we're, we kind of have to think about and have to be aware of. And another thing is, as I said, undefined behavior and the optimizer. And undefined behavior can also be your friend, because um, if you write something that the compiler cannot assume, can assume is not going to be this, so if, if you have something like you add two numbers together, uh, integer overflow is undefined behavior. But the good thing is that the compiler can assume it doesn't happen, optimize based on that assumption, right? So that means integer operations are going to be fast. So in that sense, undefined behavior is actually a good thing as long as you don't run into it. Uh, <laughs> because it makes your code fast, the absence of 
uh, uh, those checks that the compiler doesn't have to do because it can just assume stuff. And in C++23, we actually have now a very sharp knife. We can inject assumptions into the compiler directly. So this is basically giving you this uh, direct hook into the compiler to inject more undefined behavior into it. Um, this is uh, um, a proposal that I have actually worked on. It took about three years to get this to the committee, but finally, finally we're there. Here's an example. Um, let's say this is not a particularly useful function. Um, take the number and divide it by 32, right? So on Clang, this gives you this output. But now you can say, well, let's just assume that the number is not negative. And now the compiler says, uh, okay, well, if the number would be negative, that would be undefined behavior. This is what you're doing. If you write assume something, it means I promise this is going to be true. Don't check it. Believe me, and optimize based on the assumption that it's always going to be true, right? So if you mess it up, you have instant undefined behavior. But if you get it right, then um, in this case, uh, if the number is actually positive, uh, the compiler doesn't have to handle negative values at all, and it can just replace the division with a bit shift because it doesn't have to handle the negative number case. If you then put in a negative number, you get a rubbish result. You get some me meaningless result, but that's kind of what you ask for. Uh, you could also get crashes or whatever, unfined behavior, right? But uh, it allows you to, to um, uh, basically force the compiler to generate more optimal code. This is, of course, a toy example, but here's kind of a more real-world example. This is something that in audio um, happens um, quite a lot. You have to do, um, you have to clamp uh, um, the, the data. You have like an array of floats and you need to uh, uh, clamp them to values between minus one and one, right? But then a lot of the time, you know things that the compiler cannot know or cannot see through, but you know that they're true because they're an invariant somewhere in your code, but your compiler cannot see through your code and figure it out on its own. So you need to help it by using assumptions. And so here you can, for example, say, well, I'm going to assume that the size is not zero. I'm going to assume that, and this happens in audio actually quite a lot, that the, the size is a multiple of 32 or some other number, uh, some power of two. And we can also assume that uh, uh, the, the numbers in there are not nonce and not infinite, but like some regular, regular floating point numbers. And, and we can do this, for example, because this is just the way our file format works or whatever. And you know that there can never be a none in there. And if your code is designed like this, you can inject these assumptions and then you get much better code generation. If you plug this into the compiler, you're going to see, um, you're going to see that it's, it's going to generate you know, very different assembly. Um, so we need to think about, you can use the optimizer in this way, but also we need to think about the hardware, right? So, so this is, uh, a chip. This is a diagram of a chip. Uh, it's actually, this image is, I think, 10 years old, so I think probably now it's even more complex. Um, but we have to be aware of all of this stuff, right? So here's the actual CPU. It has a pipeline, right? So it has kind of instruction level parallelism. You have uh, instructions going through the pipeline and um, for example, when the red when the red instruction is going to be executed, the blue instruction is also still in the middle of being executed. So, um, for example, if the, if the blue one contains a condition uh, and we don't know if you need to jump to a different instruction, we're going to, there's speculative execution and branch prediction, right? So we're going to just execute the red instruction anyway. And so that actually affects performance because branch mispredicts are very expensive. And here's a fun example that you can try yourself at home. Um, so here is a vector of floats. We just fill it with some random numbers that are randomly positive or negative. And then we just count how many positives we have. Okay? And now we do the same thing, but before we count them, we sort them. And it turns out this line of code here is going to run a lot faster if you previously sort it. Why is that? It's the same stuff. We are counting the same number of floats, right? So it's the same amount of instructions. Why does it run faster? Yes. 
exactly. So exactly. So we get one mispredict, but without the salt, we get a lot of mispredicts, and they're very expensive. So it's a pipeline stall. Um, there is actually a feature in C++. Um, you can um, you can have likely and unlikely attributes. So if you have a um, branch that you want to tell the compiler is more likely than another branch, you can put an attribute on there. Um, this is actually really good for things like um, if you have the hot path, but the hot path is actually not executed very often. But you need the hot path to be fast. But it turns out they're not that easy to use. Um, and surprisingly, actually likely and likely don't affect the branch predictor at all which to me was surprising, but it turns out modern CPUs don't actually have instructions to tell the branch predictor what to assume. They don't, don't have those, those instructions. But you, if, uh, um, if you use these attributes, it still affects the code layout because the, the compiler is going to sort the likely branch to the top or something like that. Um, these attributes, they have a bunch of pitfalls. So there's this blog post by Aaron Baumann about them, and there's a wonderful talk by Amir Kirsch and Tom of Roman about them. They looked at some performance and did some benchmarks, and it's super cool, um, super interesting. I recommend you check that out if you want to know how to use these. They're not easy to use. And sometimes you put likely on a branch, and it actually performs worse than before. So that actually happens. So again, you need to measure. Another thing that you get with these CPU pipelines is uh, data dependency, right? So if it's not a branch, but for whatever reason, the red instruction needs a piece of data that the blue instruction has produced. But the blue instruction hasn't finished the pipeline yet. So then you get a thing called a data hazard. Uh, and again, then the red instruction has to wait for the data to be available. And that's going to slow everything down. Here's an example. Uh, you have um, a function that uh, takes a string and uh, parses it into an integer. Okay, Very easy. But the problem here is that this line of code here takes the result and uses the result for the next iteration, right? So, and you have this whole thing is in the hot loop here. So, so this is exactly the situation where you get a data hazard and you get a, basically a pipeline stall because th this instruction has to wait before the other has finished and produced the result. And so that's going to slow everything down. This is from a talk by Andrew Alexandrescu from 2015, where he explains how to rewrite this algorithm so that it's actually three times faster, but this the way it's written here is, is not going to be not going to be fast. Um, so worth keeping that in mind because it's totally not obvious from just the C++, right? You kind of have to know about this. Another thing is SIMD, so that's single instruction multiple data, uh, where you can have one instruction and you can perform an operation like a multiplication or something on multiple numbers at the same time. Highly CPU specific, right? So on Intel, you have SSE, AVX. On, on ARM, like this one, you have Neon. And then there's different ways to use this as well, right? So you can rely on auto-vectorization, by which the compiler is just magically going to auto-vectorize your code and put SIMD instructions in there. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work. Like, for example, if you're implementing convolution, uh, the way that algorithm is designed, the auto-vectorizer cannot auto-vectorize it. So then you would have to do it yourself either using explicit SIMD instructions, like writing assembly or writing um, uh, intrinsics, or there are SIMD libraries that you can use. Um, and there's another technique, which is also really cool, which I, I um, found out about. Uh, it's called SWAR, SIMD within a register, where you don't actually use proper SIMD registers. You, you just use one 64-bit uh, uh, register. But you put, for example, two 32-bit numbers in there. And then you do an operation on both of those numbers uh, at the same time with one instruction on this one register, right? So that's a cool technique. Here's an example for uh, how you need to keep in mind auto-vectorization. So this is a um, piece of code uh, that doesn't do really anything interesting. It has a bunch of arrays, and it, it goes loops through them and does some stuff. And it turns out if you write it like this, um, your code is not going to be auto-vectorized, or at least not on the compilers that I've tried. Because you have this thing here where um, basically you have one element of an array and another element of the same array in the same loop iteration. So it can't like auto-vectorize it because you're doing different things to different elements of the same array that are next to each other. Turns out, if you just restructure this code very, very slightly, 
the code on the right hand side is obviously doing exactly the same as the code on the left hand side, but you kind of shifted where the loop is by, by one, right? And so now you don't have this problem anymore. The loop is such that um, there's no different elements of the same array being referenced in the loop anymore. And now the compiler can auto vectorize this loop. And so this is the assembly for the left version, and this is the assembly for the right version, and you get the, sim you get the SIMD instructions generated there. So it's going to be a lot faster, which is, again, completely not obvious by just looking at the code because it's doing the same. Um, and then the other thing that we have if you go away from the CPU is we have memory, right? And we have this memory hierarchy. We have registers, we have level one cache, level two cache, level three cache, then probably also multiple cores and stuff. Uh, and so some of these levels are going to be shared or specific to a core. And every level, like register L1, L3, L2, L3, every, every level is going to be about an order of magnitude slower than, than the previous level. So you really want to have as much of the data as possible in registers, and then as much as possible in L1, L2, L3 cache, and so on. So uh, it's a good idea to uh, be aware of this. Um, there's functions you know, where you pass in some kind of flag or something like this as a parameter. Uh, probably not good API design, but more importantly, it's going to take up a register. You don't want that. You want your registers to be there for the stuff that actually you're actually computing on. So instead of making it a parameter, you would probably want to make it a kind of tag type that you pass or a non-type template parameter or something like this, because then it's not going to take up a register. Here's another thing. If you have a uh, non-trivial destructor on Itanium ABI, which is GCC and Clang, it means this struct cannot be passed in a register anymore. So again, something to be aware of. And of course, the most important thing, minimizing cache misses, right? So that's the one thing that slows down performance more than anything else, cache misses. Data cache, instruction cache, right? So what you want is you want data locality, you want to align data on cache lines, you want to traverse it contiguously, which is also good for the prefetcher, which kind of guesses which is the data that you might want to use next and prefetch it from memory. That's why almost always std vector and std array are kind of the containers you want to use. You don't want to use node-based containers like std maps, std set, because the memory is all over the place. You're going to get cache misses all the time. So a lot of low latency people, they have their own custom kind of um, custom containers like flat set and flat map, which we're now getting in CBSS 23, which is basically a sorted vector with a map or set interface. Uh, AppStyle has a bunch of containers. Lots of finance people write their own super optimized hash tables and things like that. And there's actually a lot of kind of ways you can make an algorithm more cache friendly. Consider, for example, binary search. So binary search, yeah, log n. You kind of hop around uh, until you find um, the number you're looking for. If we, um, so it sounds good, but if you draw a heat map of, um, of which elements we are touching, it turns out that the most frequently touched elements are kind of like in the middle and then at like one fourth in, three fourths in, and so on and so forth, right? So, so if you do a binary search, we're going to be hopping around a lot. That's not very cache friendly. Uh, turns out there was a way to rearrange this data structure such that the heat map looks like this, right? That's going to be a um, cache friendly binary search where the order is different. And that's optimized for not having catch misses, so it's going to be a lot. Um, it's going to be a lot faster. Um, there's lots of talks about these kind of techniques. I just want to point out one. Eduardo Madrid gave a talk this year at C++ Now, where he talked a lot about um, kind of these hash tables, uh, optimized hash tables, and also the um, cache friendly binary search. And yeah, just just one talk. But there's many more. There's many techniques in this space. And you also want to minimize instruction cache misses, not just data cache misses, right? So it's important to look at what the generated code is like. What's the code layout? What's the code alignment? All of those things can affect uh, whether or not you get an instruction cache miss. You want to avoid branches. You want to avoid virtual functions because they're also branches. Um, so you can use the variant instead of polymorphism. You can use compile time polymorphism like CRTP, mixing classes. In CSS23, we're getting deducing this, which makes writing CRTP a lot easier. And you want to keep the cache warm, right? So if you have um, data in the cache that you need to touch on your hot path, you want to make sure it's in cache. 
you don't want to go to memory, right? So you need to do things like you can periodically poke it on a timer, for example. Um, that works for some use cases where the data is touched rarely, but if it's touched, it needs to be in cache. You can do something very similar with the instruction cache as well. If you have a critical path that only is ever being called very rarely, but you want it to be, you want the code to be in the cache. Um, what you can do is you can periodically run that code with some dummy input, um, and then it's going to stay in instruction cache. Uh, there's a bunch of talks um, about cache-friendly programming, um, and there's many more. I just pointed out um, a few of them here, so definitely recommend those. And now um, I have 10 minutes left, yeah? Okay, um, let's whiz through this quickly then. It took actually quite a lot longer than I thought. Uh, last time I gave this talk, it was 45 minutes. Weird. Uh, interesting. So, um, so we talked about efficiency. Now let's talk about a few techniques targeting low latency. And that's the case where now we're really doing something very different from when you want to optimize for bandwidth. You're optimizing for the worst case rather than the optimal, the, the average case, right? And so if you, if you want your worst case performance to be as good as possible, you don't want to do any of those things, right? Because you don't know how long they're going to take. They don't have deterministic execution time. Most of the time it's going to be fine, but every once in a while it's going to take a long time. You don't want that. You want the worst case performance to be as fast as possible for low latency. So in your hot path, you're not going to have dynamic memory locations or DL locations. You don't want to block the thread, take a mutex. You don't want to do any IO or stutzy out or something like this. Um, you don't want to throw an exception because that's also a memory allocation in general case. You don't want to have any context switches or mode switches between user and kernel space because that's also slow. Um, so you can't do any syscalls. You can't do any system calls on your hot path. Uh, you can't call into any unknown code that you don't know doesn't have it and doesn't do any of those things. You should avoid loops without definite bounds. Um, and you should avoid any algorithms that basically are not constant time. Because for all of those things, you don't know how long they will take. They don't have a deterministic upper bound of how long they're going to take. And so um, you're not optimizing for the worst case there. One particular example, um, avoiding allocations. Some SDL algorithms actually allocate memory. Did you know that? So there's actually exactly three algorithms in the STL where the standard has a sentence like this. Complexity. If enough extra memory is available, the complexity is this. Otherwise, it's that. And if you see this in the C++ standard, you know, ah, OK. It's going to try and allocate a buffer uh, because then there's a more efficient implementation in terms of complexity. But you get a memory allocation, and you don't want that in your hot path. So those are the three. Don't use those um, in your hot path. Obviously, don't use data structures that allocate either. So we can use array, pair, tuple, optional variant, because all of those are on the stack. They're not going to allocate dynamic memory. Anything that has type erasure will allocate memory, std any, std function. Anything that has dynamic size, like string, vector, deck, you can't use any of those. Lots of low latency people use static vector, right, which is a vector where everything's inside the vector on the stack, and it has a fixed capacity. Not the same as std array. Std array is fixed size. This is fixed capacity, not fixed size. We're actually going to get this in C++26 in the standard. There is a paper now in flight, which we still have to figure out a few design questions. But um, I think it's pretty safe to say that static vector is going to be in C++26. You can do the same with function and any and, and all of the other kind of uh, things where you say, OK, we have an in-place function, which is like the function, but uh, it has a maximum size. And then it's stored in the object, right? So you don't have to go to the heap. So those, those kind of uh, classes are very, very uh, useful for low latency. And, and the idea is that if you try and store a std function in there that doesn't fit into the object, um, you get a compile error. So it's essentially like small object optimization, except it's enforced, basically. Um, custom allocators. And that's really the thing where bandwidth and low latency kind of are different. So there are lots of custom allocators like uh, TC malloc, that's like the Google one, which is brilliant. It's a lot faster than, than malloc. But um, it's optimized for bandwidth. And so what it's going to do is it's going to manage 
lots of internal data structures to get, get your memory faster, but when it runs out, it will still go to system malloc to allocate more memory. You can't do that. So you basically have to pre-allocate everything if you're doing low latency stuff. So you have a monotonic allocator, which is actually in C++17, uh, CPMR monotonic buffer resource, where it's just a pre-allocated array and it's going to give you chunks from that array until it runs out. You have something a little bit better, uh, pool allocators. They have like chunks of different sizes, and so they can also reclaim uh, memory, but everything's pre-allocated. Then game people have lots of other fancy allocators, like frame allocators or arena allocators or other things. And then you can have a log-free allocator, which requires a helper thread, where basically you allocate memory, you have some kind of watermark, and, and when you go above that watermark, another thread is going to allocate more memory and kind of slide that in with some log-free uh, programming. You can't block on a hot path, right? So you can't use a std mutex or anything else like barrier latch. They all do some syscalls or something like that. So you only can use std atomic as the a synchronization mechanism, right? And std atomic refs in C++. When a classical example is you have this hot path and then you have a volume slider and then the user changes the volume and the number needs to affect the hot path, right? So how do you get the, the number from one thread to another? Well, if it's just a number, you can store it in a state atomic, and that's going to be fine. That's, that's weight-free, lock-free. Um, but you need to check that it's actually lock-free. Um, so you need to, to do this um, static assert here. Um, and also, um, memory order is a tricky topic, but it does affect the performance as well. Um, if, if your data doesn't fit into an atomic, and you still need to share it between threads where one is a hot path, um, then you have different options. You can have a uh, spin lock with progressive backoff, uh, where kind of the, the real time thread says, okay, try lock. If it's not there, okay, I'm going to do some fallback strategy here. And the other thread has, has a lock um, where basically it spins until the real time thread is, is finished. Um, and then you have lots of other lock free and, and, and wait free data structures. Like the, the classical one is the single producer, single consumer queue where you have one reader thread and one writer thread, and the reader thread is doing pop, and the writer thread is doing push, and you can do this in a weight-free way, and it's actually not even that hard. The implementation fits in one slide. And you can use this data structure to pump things in and out of, of your hot path, right? So if somebody is playing a keyboard, you're getting notes, and you can, you can stream them into the hot path with a log-free FIFO. If you're reading a file from disk, you can stream those those uh, packets into the hot path using a lock for. If you want to stream something out, like you have a visualizer, you want to visualize what you're rendering, you can stream it out using a lock free FIFO. It's not just for audio, it's for all of those things. Um, you can use it for I.O. If you log something, logging something on a critical path, you cannot do I.O., you cannot create a string, but you can create a, kind of a trivial copy object and then put it into a lock free queue. So speaking of I.O., so if you need, need to do output on the critical path, yes, you use the log-free FIFO. If you want to uh, uh, do I.O. between processes, people often do shared memory. And if you want to communicate with hardware, you want to use direct memory access. You want to just you want to bypass the operating system, basically. Um, I'm running low on time, right? I do have not that many slides left. Can I have like five more minutes? Is that good? Okay. So um, speaking of sharing data between threads, so there is um, kind of uh, um, streaming data from one thread into another, which you can do with the FIFO. But sometimes you have a single object or a single value um, that you need to actually share between threads. So there's like one value, and then both of those threads, like the hot path and another thread, need to simultaneously access the value and either read it or write it. And then it becomes tricky. If it's just a number or something short that fits into one word, then you can, again, just use atomic. Otherwise, it gets, it gets tricky. So there are a number of techniques. There are a number of talks uh, about this topic. Um, how do you synchronize a value that doesn't fit into an atomic between a kind of low latency thread and another thread? There is the approach which... Um, Dave Rowland and Fabian Van Giles um, have presented in, this is a really good talk, Real Time 101, can highly recommend it, um, from Meeting C++ uh, 2019. So cast loop, basically the real time thread does an atomic pointer swap 
and then uses the object here, and that's a null pointer. And then the other thread spins on this other thing not being a null pointer and then swaps the pointers on, on, on its side. Um, and there's another technique, which is actually better because it allows multiple uh, weight-free readers, is RCU. Again, a bunch of talks. I also gave a talk actually this year at the Audio Developer Conference about RCU. And if you want to do, uh, if, if the writing needs to be weight-free, so if, if um, the lock, the, the real-time thread or the low latency thread needs to actually write a value and then other, other threads need to pick it up. Um, you can do double buffering, uh, which is something that also is covered in Dave and Fabian's talk. Or you can use a technique which is really cool, which I've only found out about relatively recently. It's called a sec lock. This is super cool. Um, I'm currently working on an implementation of this. I'm going to do a talk just about the sec lock next year because it's so cool, I think. I want to I wanna talk about this. Um, Error handling. How do you do error handling if you want to optimize for the worst case? You can't allocate. Obviously, you can't have exceptions. You can have error codes. Not great. Not great API design. You can do std optional, which is better. But then std optional doesn't really tell you what the error is, right? So std optional is great if you either have a value or you don't. And why you don't have a value is either obvious or you don't care. But if you actually want to transport an error out of the function, then std expected is great, and, and it's coming in C++23. And I have actually um, mentioned this in my C++, um, in my CVPCon keynote this year. Um, I have a long section about std expected, so please check it out if, you, if you're curious. I think it's really cool. It's a good way to do error handling in these low latency you know, contexts. Um, another, like, a couple of slides on, like, very specialized things sometimes you need to prevent memory from being swapped out of memory and being kind of uh, put on disk. That's, for example, the case if you have a big sample library, you, you have some kind of, uh, I don't know, 10 gigabytes worth of piano samples that you're playing, but you want those 10 gigabytes to be in memory and you don't want them to be swapped out. So every operating system gives you some kind of API to lock an address range into RAM to prevent the operating system from being swapped out. Another thing that you sometimes want to do is you want to really avoid context switches or mode switches between user space and kernel space. And so depending on what you're doing and what the hardware is, there's different ways to do this. If you're writing a game or a piece of audio software for like a mainstream operating system like Android or macOS or whatever, then pretty much the only tool you have in user space is that priority. But it kind of works in practice if you have a hot, uh, um, high priority thread Schedulers are smart and, and they know to not switch, context switch out of that thread um, if you're doing things correctly. On a real-time operating system, and this is kind of not my domain, but I'm curious to learn more about this, you actually have a deterministic threat scheduler where you can uh, uh, reason about that thread not being switched out. And if you control the hardware, you can actually do a kernel bypass and you can, like, this is something that the finance people do. They all have these, like, um, uh, uh, specialized network cards where if you send like a packet to the exchange, you just completely bypass the operating system and you just directly write into the memory in that network card and it sends it out immediately. Um, and if your critical path is in a single thread and you don't care about the performance of other threads, which is true for some low latency applications, you can do other things. You can turn off hyper-threading because then uh, you, know, you don't have these multiple pipelines passing through the same CPU and so then that can also help with um, with that, and you can also, um, pretty much every operating system has some kind of API to um, for CPU affinity, where you can say, this thread needs to remain on this core, and it's not going to be swapped to another core, so you don't, again, you don't get a switch. Okay, and so um, that's pretty much the material I had. There's just one little announcement I want to make. I'm actually working on a new uh, open source library, uh, which is called uh, Krill. Um, I'm doing this together with Fabian Van Giles. I mentioned his talk earlier. Uh, we have a GitHub. Krill stands for Cross-Platform Real-Time I.O. and Low-Latency Library. And it's free on GitHub. Um, there's not much there yet. So right now, the only thing that there is is the spin lock with progressive backoff that I wrote last year. But the plan is um, that we're going to put pretty much all of the utilities that I've talked about um, at some point into this library. And so it's going to be a collection of all of these kind of low latency C++ utilities uh, that you're going to be able to use for free. So it's very much in its early stages. It's just a hobby project at this point. 
but hopefully it will grow into a comprehensive library for low latency stuff. And a lot of the stuff that I've talked about will be in there, hopefully at some point, um, if, I, if and when I get the time to, to add more stuff. And that's it. Um, thank you very much for listening. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>